Let us pray. And now, Lord, by the presence of your illuminating, awesome spirit, that, Lord, we would be able to take what we've heard of this narrative from Luke that you've inspired and bring it home into our hearts, enable it to live, Lord, in our daily life. Fill us again in a fresh way with your hope, we ask in your name. Amen. Mid-afternoon of this past Friday, Jeannie and I headed into the uh, YMCA for a swim. And I ran into a good friend in the men's locker room as I was changing, and we were talking. He's a believer. And so we kind of caught up and so on for a few moments, and then I went off for the swim. After we had finished, I headed back into the men's locker room to change. And as I did, I overheard a conversation taking place between two guys that was just down from me. And the older guy said to the younger man there, hang in there. And then he left for the shower. And so this guy was just to my right. And so I picked up the conversation and I said, oh, so you're hanging in there? I I never met this guy, but I'd seen him in the locker room different times. The young man responded. He says, yes, I'm hanging in there, but it's tough. It's been tough. Now, before I go any further with the conversation, let me just say that as I was changing, before I went into the pool, this young man overheard this conversation I was having with this other friend. And we had been quite open about, you know, things that pertain to our faith in Christ together. So he was hearing that. So here we go, back into the conversation. So uh, I asked, you're hanging in there. And then I responded, in what ways? Well, I've recently... Uh, been, uh, I've just recently gotten out of real estate after six years because it's corrupt. And I've split with my partner and now I'm living in my Jeep. And I stopped and I turned towards him and I asked, uh, wait a minute here, you're living in your Jeep? Yeah, I'm living in my Jeep, but it's a good Jeep a Jeep Wrangler, and I park it at Walmart, at Walmart's overnight, and no one bothers me, and uh, it's cold, but I keep warm. As I re- am recalling the uh, conversation, I'm pretty sure he said, uh, well, I come to the Y here, I work out, and now I'm in need of money for a meal to be able to eat. So we're going back and forth, and then finally I ask him, let's just say his name is Matt, not his real name, Matt. Do you have hope? Hope? I have no hope. I have no hope in anything. I have no hope in anyone. I have nothing. Well, that was the end of the conversation. You know, I didn't, you know, go into some super pastor mode and, you know, all of a sudden lead him to a life-saving faith in Christ, and now he's going to be baptized next week, and so on. That did not happen in that occasion. But I do hope to be able to have a continued conversation with him because I'm keen on inviting him to the Christmas Eve service that Janice and Taylor are planning because what a perfect place for somebody that obviously is not used to ever going to a church and hearing about hope. Hopelessness. No hope in anything, in anyone, living and sleeping in a Jeep Wrangler in the parking lot of of Walmarts, Beverly, Massachusetts. How does, quote, Matt, or any of us who sunk into hopelessness, become overflowing with hope again? I mean, how and what does that engagement with God look like that would enable there to be that kind of a significant shift in us or in anyone that we know? What does that look like? Well, as uh, Janice, you read for us, this narrative of this Luke uh, chapter, chapter one, uh, outlines for us that shift that happens, that moves from hopelessness to overflowing hope in the life of of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we see four movements that I believe that can take place in any of our lives in moving us out of and from hopelessness 
into overflowing with hope. Now, it looks neat, and it looks clean, and it looks tidy and sanitized and so on, but we know that this is really, truly messy and difficult. But here, first, the experience of hopelessness, verses 5 to 7. Secondly, what an encounter with hopefulness also looks like, 11 through 17. Third, what a response of deeply ingrained skepticism looks like, verse 18. And finally, just a little bit of verse 67, what it looks like when we become overflowing with hope again. So walk with me. Uh, let's walk through this narrative beginning in verses 5 to 7. I'm going to read sections that have already been read for us just so that we can track and I can track as we, fall, as we walk through this. So again, here it is again. In the time of Herod, king of Judea. Well, first off, who, who is this Herod, king of uh, Judea? Well, he's the Herod of Matthew's gospel, and uh, he's the insanely insecure person uh, of his position as king of the Jews. Uh, he's heard the testimony of the wise men that have come to Bethlehem, uh, to come to Jerusalem. To, in order to find the king of the Jews, and this news completely unhinges him to the point of his having baby boys two years and younger put to death in Bethlehem. It's just the Herod who was the architect and visionary of may, uh, many uh, building initiatives and representative of the power of the oppression of Rome there in Judea. So in the time of this man, King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah and his wife Elizabeth, who was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and decrees blamelessly. They were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So first, this is king, the king of Herod in the context of their country, but second, this is the profile, the background of Elizabeth and, uh, and Zechariah. Now, uh, this piece that Luke gives us about their heritage, what he's saying there is that these two people lived in a bigger story, a bigger reality. I mean, their roots go back to the very beginnings of the founding of the people of God and the nation of Israel all part of the fulfillment of God's incredible promise to Abraham that through Abraham and his seed, all the nations on the earth were going to be blessed. And they're part of it. Well, they're, part, they're, they're sort of part of it. I mean, they don't have any kids. No seed to carry on the promise of God for the next generation, so they are believing. And Luke also outlines the kind of people they were, that they were a devout couple and uh, describing them as people that uh, uh, fulfilled the law uh, faithfully and so on, all to mean that they were people who were devout and loving God with all their hearts and then moving that out into loving their neighbor. Uh, but still, there's this big but. They are childless. And now they're very old, very old. I mean, they're very old. And, uh, and now in that, in that context regarding their childbearing, there is a hopelessness. Verse 13, they prayed for the blessing of children, nothing. 25, as a result, it's been an experience of disgrace as an emblem and as a mark of shame all through their years. Uh, a few years ago, I uh, did a teaching on the Psalms on, on aging, and I called it over the hill, but on a roll. And uh, I was describing, you know, my wife and I, our own journey as we moved through our 60s and looking into our 70s, over a hill, but on a roll. And that's exactly what Zachariah and Elizabeth were about to experience. They were over the hill, they thought, but actually in the reality of the in, uh, engagement with the living God, they were actually about to move onto a roll. Verses eight and nine, and secondly, a confrontation with hopefulness. Once when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So about this time in the life of Zechariah, he was part of one of the 24 divisions uh, out of a total of about 24,000 priests in Israel in the first century. 
And he had been chosen to go into the temple to burn incense. And uh, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. So if you've had that opportunity, then you no longer get to go into the lotto. And so you'd have that moment where it might happen and nobody else has ever had that opportunity. So this is a once in a lifetime moment for him and for any priest, verse 10 and 11. And when the time for the incense, uh, burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right hand, the right side of the altar of incense. So well, let's just slow down because we don't want to miss what's happening here. There's worshiping people that are on the outside and they're praying. And then as they're praying, verse 11, what happens next takes place inside. Just as an aside, when Ken told me first um, sometime, I don't know, May or something about this church, about union, he said, these people pray for each other in the worship service. And uh, they see God at work. Well, that's kind of what was happening here. People were praying, and then on the inside, God was at work. So for Zechariah, he's in a room that's about 10 yards long. And I tried to envision what that looked like here in our sanctuary. So I measured off 10 yards, one, two, three, and it's about eight uh, pews. So if you take where Janice is sitting and move all the way back to the, final, the one before the final pew, that's about 10 yards. And so you've got this space, rectangle, literally, of that sense of space that Zachariah is in the midst of. And right to that side of the wall, that's the, alt that's the table of showbread these loaves of bread that are baked each day to remind the people of God's provision and his faithfulness. On the other side of this wall of this narrow rectangular, that's where the candelabra, the lamp stand for the candle for anybody who's in there to be able to see. And that's burning eternal, always. It's always being lit. And then right to the front where Janice, where you're seeing, that's where the altar of incense was. There was a curtain right in front of you. And that altar incense was covered with gold. And on the right uh, uh, it was all covered, and th it was an incense, so there was this smoke, sweet-selling smoke, that was just kind of going up, and some in symbol of expression of, of, of prayer that was happening inside, and what God was revealing uh, on the outside from inside. So it's there, right there at the altar of incense to the right, right there, uh, Janice, an angel appears. And it's really interesting to see how Luke describes this because verse 12, when Zachariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. I mean, the, the way he describes it is that the angel was there, but it wasn't at first that Zachariah actually, oh, I, I didn't realize you were here. And all of a sudden, you're there. And he's gripped with and startled with, with fear. Angel, though, reassures him, don't be afraid, Zachariah. And this, this, these are the words. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you're to call him John. Just stop a moment with me. How long had they been praying for that word to come from God? Think, let's just think about that. Yeah, I imagine that they prayed together when they were still able to bear children physically. Um, but then, as it became apparent that they were no longer able, my guess is, I assume, that, hey, it ain't going to happen, Elizabeth. It's not going to happen. You know, for whatever the reason, the answer is no, and we're not able. Now they're very old. I'm assuming, it's just a guess, that it had been maybe 20 years since they had stopped praying and this hopelessness about this part of their lives had kind of set in. I mean, what's the point? Our next big event in life is our exit. You know, our death, that's what's ahead. And so now the angel is informing them, your prayers that you've been praying 
20 years ago, 15 years ago, I don't know, but it's been a while, whatever it's been, when they had a sense of faith, a sense of anticipation that God might step in, that God has now heard them and responded. See, it's not easy, it's messy, it's difficult, it's challenging, but it's still a journey from hopelessness to overflowing with hope. And so Luke says, this child that is going to be yours is going to be a joy and a delight to you. And then the news of God stepping in to enabling their son to be a part of God's unfolding promise to Abraham and to his people. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their parents to their children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, just you've prayed this for a long time, and then you cease praying this, and then now you're, hear, you're hearing that all of a sudden in your very old very old age, you're, th that what you prayed for 20 years ago is now, now, going to, is a, it's going to happen now. It's going to happen now. I mean, I think for any of us, that is just absolutely beyond comprehension. I mean, just if, if it happened personally, that's one thing. That's huge. That's incredible. But if it's beyond that, to involve this oppression that we're experiencing with the last 500 years, all of a sudden there's going to be a turning point in that. And so thirdly, Zechariah, and I would assume in our own humanity, re re responded like we would, responding out of a deeply ingrained skepticism and disbelief. So Zechariah asked the Lord, how can I be assured of this? I'm an old man and uh, my wife is well along in years. How is it possible that we are over the hill, Gabriel. And now you're telling me that we're going to be on a roll? Huh. Hey, those of you who are our age, 69 or above, you know, how many of you have said, oh, the Lord can't use us now? I mean, you can say that younger and just have doubts. Oh, we're too old or we're beyond. We're right, and We're in the same field here, right? Yeah. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I've sent to speak, been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent, not able to speak until the day that this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointing time. Oh, let's just step back and chew on that. I mean, it seems a little harsh, I mean, compared to how the angel Gabriel responded to Mary. Here's the thing. Somewhere, somehow, Zachariah seemed to have lost the reality of God, that God was present and active. And yeah, he was doing all the outward stuff as a priest going through the motions, but inside he had lost his faith in God actively being engaged with a sense of expectation of his being present with him and with their people. And the Lord rebukes him. He says, you're not going to be able to speak for the next nine plus months. He then is living in a form of spiritual discipline. Why not being able to speak? I mean, what's the point? For him to learn to listen to God again to be act become actively aware of the reality of the presence of God in the temple with him as a priest, with him now as a husband, and as a father. And then after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. For five months they remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor, taken away my disgrace among his people. And during these nine months plus, he meditates on what the angel has, has said. And he's anticipating that he's now Elizabeth's pregnant. And he's anticipating, okay, God, what are you doing? He's a priest. He knows the Old Testament cold, backwards and forwards. He knows the plan of God as prophesied by, by the prophets. I mean, <clears throat> so he's reflecting on that. And uh, the anticipation of 
delight and joy. And there's something powerful that's happening in this kind of this weird wilderness of expectation as he meditates and as he struggles with his hopelessness. But now there's something new that's obviously God stepping in in a new way, breathing into him hope. And then we get this amazing thundering word after all this happens. And John is born. He's named by his father. And he's able to speak that name. And so then we get to verse 67. His father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. Because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he has said through his holy prophets long ago. Salvation from our, of our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. I mean now he's stepping into overflowing with I mean just a hopefulness. And he sees the beginning. The seeds of a revolution of a movement of God that's seeing the beginning of the Jesus movement that take hold of the Roman world. See, an amazing, incredible God intervention of moving out of a state of hopelessness. It's not going to happen. We've given up. We're not going to pray anymore. God, for whatever the reason, is not present with us. And then having some sort of an engagement with God that's powerful and it's real, where we're once again able to see what hope looks like. And then as our skepticism that we're so deeply ingrained in begins to erode and soften, and there's something new that's happening inside us that God is stepping inside us, enabling us to once again seeing hope and believing that there's an anticipation of the presence of God with us every day, wherever we are, in our ordinary moments of our, of our, of our moments of wherever we are. Now, some of you will say, oh, wait a minute, hold on, Jim. It's one thing for you to preach about Zechariah. It's another thing for us to take that account and all of a sudden talk about the opportunity for hopefulness for any of us today. Wait a minute, Jim, you've just made a step that you can't do. Well, hold on, hold on. Let's just parallel with Paul in Romans 15, verses 12 and 13. Here's what he states, a very good commentary on Luke 1. Again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. Then he states this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's for all of us, friends. That's for whatever situation that we find ourselves mired in, that we've gotten lost in some dark hole that all of a sudden we find ourselves not able to get out of. And an invitation for however deep that hole is for us to be raised up again, filled with hope so that we can begin to live again. Whatever our age is, over the hill, but on a roll. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being able to sing these words of light and darkness wherever we are on that journey, that movement of this hope-filling work that you seek to do within, Lord, the ingrained skepticism and doubt that resides in us at times that, Lord, you'd move us to this engagement with you that would enable us in, in a new way to be able to hope again because you're filling us again with yourself in a new way. And we pray that, Lord, for each of us. And, Lord, I pray for that for Matt as he lives out each day in his Jeep Wrangler in the parking lot at Walmarts. And, Lord, I pray that you would bring him to our Christmas Eve service. And I pray that, Lord, in your name. Amen.